I want to begin a series of lessons this afternoon. And one reason I want to do it today, at least at this time, is because it too has to do with fundamentals and first principles regarding the church and matters pertaining thereto. And since we're doing what we're calling rightly dividing the word of truth on Sunday morning in the class or what saith the scriptures, I think you'll find that these two will somewhat dovetail together to bolster one another up. And that is one of the big reasons at this time that I want to do this. What I want to do is begin a study today, and much of it will be introductory, on the restoration principles. First of all, to understand, and we'll see this develop more as we go through the study, that the principle of restoring the Bible to its rightful place is the only rule of faith and practice. Also, of the gospel plan of salvation, as it appears in the totality of the teaching of the New Testament concerning how men are saved from sin and how men are saved and kept saved in the church, as well as the church and its organization work in worship and so on. So with that, I would like to simply turn to Jeremiah 6 and verse 16. Jeremiah 6 and verse 16. I say a good part of this will be introduction, but I think these things that we'll say in the introduction will be helpful when we get on as we develop this particular study of restoration principles. In Jeremiah 6 and verse 16, God said to Judah through the prophet, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Quite amazingly and sadly, the people of that day to whom these words were said replied to God with, We will not walk therein. It's hard to understand uh, people who were created as Israel was to be what he intended them to be that they could fall so far short that when God through the prophet tells them to do this, that they just simply and adamantly and stubbornly say, we're not going to do it. But that does teach us how easy it is for us to slip, slide away into apostasy. And where we once loved the Lord and loved his word and studied it, we can reach a stage to where it doesn't make any difference at all to us. In fact, we're right the opposite from what we once were we're now adamantly opposed to it. In John 14, 6, another very common passage, keeping in mind Jeremiah 6, 16, our Lord said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes of the Father but by me. Then if you go back to the book of Matthew in Matthew 11 and verse 29, you see Jesus speaking again, and therein he stresses, that by our coming to him, remember he's the way, by our coming to him, the way, we shall find rest unto our souls. So it seems to me, if there were no other passages in the Bible concerning these points, that these make it very clear that we ought to have a deep abiding concern about the Lord as the way and that we must walk therein. That's the only way to heaven. If we're not interested in going to heaven, then we don't pay any attention to these things, and we do like the most of the world does, as it pleases, or at least it attempts to. But keeping those points in mind, again, this is introducing the restoration principles. If you go to Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 51, you have the sacred account of, of our Lord's going up to Jerusalem with his parents when he was 12 years old. And of course, when they get ready to leave, he is lost by his parents. They think he's with the company that's going back up to Galilee, but he's not. 
So I want us to make a point here. It may be a learning aid to us that in this connection, we can observe that, number one, Mary and Joseph were together, watch it, with the Lord in Jerusalem. They left Jerusalem, and in doing so, they left the Christ. In their journey, they came to, watch it, realize that they had departed from him when they left him in Jerusalem. So what did they do? They turned back. They went back to Jerusalem, and guess what? They found Jesus where he had been when they left. They found him in Jerusalem. The next point is this. The apostles and members of the first century church were together with our Lord Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. And all was well when that was the case. In time, we know that men departed from the Jerusalem gospel, the faith. And when they did that, they left the Christ. But certain men later on came to realize, underscore realize, that they had departed from Christ and his gospel system, and they turned back to Jerusalem. And again, they found him, and may we say he is yet to be found, in Jerusalem. Now, I say again that reference is here made to this reading, not to prove anything, but to illustrate a point. It sets forth points to which certain facts in church history are distinctly analogous. So as I said a moment ago, this becomes a memory too. If you go on over to the New Testament to Paul's writing to the young preacher Tim, uh, Titus in Titus chapter 1 verses 1 through 3, the divine record has this to say. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before times eternal but in his own seasons manifested his words in the message. Wherewith I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now think about this with me for a moment. Let's examine that passage as it fits into the introductory matters concerning restoration principles. Paul here in stress, first of all, that God promised and prepared for eternal life regarding mankind. The second point made by Paul to Titus is that God manifested his plan to man. He revealed it. So everyone, all who would have the expectation of heaven, eternal life, must be concerned about the divine plan. That's very important to understand. It's not that Christ just saves us, but he saves us through a divine plan, which was in the mind of God before the world was. Now, at this time, I want to then engage, and that's introductory to this study, beginning study, of restoration principles. Now, what's the purpose in all of this? Well, it's our purpose to set forth and to give as much emphasis as we can to some of the great underlying biblical principles that are related to people's effort to restore ancient, pure, primitive, New Testament Christianity. I say it that way because I want to make sure that that's distinct from sectarian denominational Christianity, which is founded upon the commandments and doctrines of men, which is also 
the way that most people who believe in Christ think of the church is a denominational concept of the church. We may very well think that all the immoralities of our nation and secularism and atheism and all of that is terrible, and it is. It's a tool of the devil to cause us to be lost, and they are. But probably the greatest tool that the devil's come up with in the last 2,000 years to cause men to be destroyed is to make them think they're acceptable to God. They're saved by Jesus Christ, even allowing them to believe in the God, the God of the Bible and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. The Bible is the Word of God. And man needs saving, and man can't save himself, and only Christ can save them. And then end up believing what is false doctrine concerning how a person is saved from sin and where the Lord puts them when they obey the gospel and just what obedience to the gospel actually is and just when one enters Christ and becomes a Christian and then the work, the organization, and worship of the church. That denominationalism has gotten wrong. It doesn't say that all things in denominations don't have some truth. But that's not what we're interested in, brethren. We're interested in the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The whole, W-H-O-L-E, counsel of God that Paul said he preached to the Ephesian church. I'm not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. I don't want a partial counsel of God. Wouldn't it be something that God gave us the plan of salvation but didn't tell us anything about the church, about its organization, its worship, and its work, an individual Christian living in the church? Well, it wouldn't accomplish anything, would it? So we want all of what God says concerning how to become a Christian, when one becomes a Christian, and living the Christian life faithfully. So we seek to bring about a greater respect, I hope, and a deeper respect appreciation for those men whose lives are so meaningfully related to the principles of these biblical principles of the restoration that we want to study with you in this series of studies. Now I propose to do this by looking at uh, basically two main divisions. The first one we'll simply call part one is the historical background. And then part two are the biblical principles themselves concerning the authority to have such a thing as a restoration of New Testament Christianity. It is believed that consideration to the historical background is essential, it's necessary, in order that we may know the meaning Underscore that word meaning. The meaning of restoration. Remember when you study through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, God unfolded how he would save man down to the stream of time, but it involved man in history. It dealt with man where he was down through all these thousands of years in giving us the way of salvation through Christ. Remember what we said earlier? Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. We're commanded in the Old Testament, the seed was planted, ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? So the old paths are God's paths. You know, they're old, but they're new. They're new to people nowadays because they don't think much about it the right division of the Bible. So I hope you'll connect this with what we're doing on Sunday morning and what says the scriptures in the right division of the word, 2 Timothy 2.15. We'll have a clear understanding by seeing how these things fit in to the historical matters. That is, a clear understanding of the very New Testament principles themselves that bring about the possibility and the reality of restoring New Testament Christianity. The principles that are as they're isolated from the very historical background, really lose much of their meaning. First of all, we'll go today as much as we can, as time will allow, to part one. 
What did we say that it was? To remind you again, part one is a study of the historical background. And we're simply calling it God prepared the perfect plan. God did not just say, I will send my son because of my great love for mankind and his love to save them into the world to become a man. But he prepared a plan. People today say, just look to Jesus, think of him, know you can't save yourself, plead with him to save you. That won't work without the plan. The New Testament gives us the plan. But let's begin back in the Old Testament. That's where the Bible begins, you know. <laughs> and in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, we find set out to us the Bible record of the very, and underscore this word, need. The very need for a plan for a human redemption. As we read the book of Origins, the book of Genesis, Moses, inspired of the Holy Spirit, wrote it. We see God creating the heavens and the earth. We see God involving himself in the work, in that particular work, in six days, 24-hour days. And he's preparing, in so doing, a suitable place for man's habitation. Now, on the sixth day, God made man and he made his bride, Adam and Eve. And he placed them in a special garden for people without sin. Sin's unknown to the world at this time. I can't conceive of a place like that, but it's unknown. And he puts them in the Garden of Eden. Now God gave Adam and Eve blessings that are marvelous and that are wonderful. And he gave them a very significant limitation. In fact, a prohibition. They were forbidden by God in no uncertain terms to partake of the fruit of the tree which was in the middle or the midst of the garden. Now this, and mark it down, this is the first example of positive divine law. That means it was wrong to partake of that tree, the fruit of it, for one reason only. Can you guess in your minds now what that would be? Because God said, don't do it. So that tested their faith in God and in God's word. Because in the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Did they understand death? I doubt it. Any more than Noah could picture in his mind the great floods. that there had never been rain on the earth all that time. But they trusted God implicitly. So for a while that was all right. But I want to remind you in categorizing God's commandments to mankind. There is that type of commandment that is right for one reason only. And only one reason. Because God said so. Now you say, well everything we're to do is because God said so. Yes, but there are those that are right for one reason only. God said so. There's no visible connection between dying and and eating the fruit off of a tree. In fact, they were to eat of all the rest of the trees of the garden. So how was this a positive law? Because that fruit on that tree would not be eaten of simply because God said don't do it. And that tested their confidence in trusting God as God. All positive law does that. You had the same thing with Abraham when you get over to Genesis 22. And other times, God forbade killing your own son. He was very upset at the idolatrous worship when they would offer their children to sacrifice. And yet here he comes to Abraham and says, Take thy son, thy son whom thou lovest, and offer a burnt offering. The question, why was it right for Abraham to begin to make plans to offer his son a more offering you have only one answer a right answer that is because God said so 
When you come to 2 Kings 5 and Naaman, a leper, incurable disease, a very great man in his accomplishments of the way the world measures greatness, but he can't be cured. Thus, he was ostracized, no doubt, from a great many people because that was a terrible disease and feared greatly by those people at that time. Well, little maid tells him there's a prophet back at home. She's from Israel. He could take care of it. Well, they don't understand. They're pagans. So he sends a letter, or the king does, bound to the king of Israel and scares him out of his wits because he thinks, well, he's trying to find a reason to invade me and to fight me. Who in the world is going to be able to have anybody anywhere that can cure leprosy? Well, we'll make a story a little bit shorter. Uh, he sends him down, and there's the prophet. He doesn't even come out personally and deal with Naaman. He sends his messenger out, his servant, Gehazi. And the prophet's word through the servant was, go dip seven times in the river Jordan, and you'll be healed. Well, he had like a lot of folks, a preconceived notion about how God should do things, and that didn't suit him, so he got all roused up and aggravated, but he had a servant who reasoned with him, said, now, you came down here prepared to do some great thing, so if you were prepared to do that, why not go ahead and do what you heard? And so he settled down, like a lot of people need to, before they're going to understand the truth, and he kept the prophet's word and went down to Jordan and dipped seven times. His leprosy was cleansed. Now, let me ask you, why did that happen? Why did the waters cleanse it? Well, the waters in and of themselves didn't. But his faith in God, in keeping what God said do, did. And that was right to do only because God said so. Now, I kidded Eric this morning with this little episode he's had where his hands are still kind of scaling off. I said, started to tell you, go down and dip seven times in the River Jordan, but I didn't think that would work for you, and it wouldn't. In fact, he could have had just exactly anybody else could today what Naaman had, and you could go dip as many times, you could go move into the water in the Jordan River, and it's not going to help because that was a command from God to one person for his situation to test his faith in God and his word. Now, this is the first record of that in Genesis when he says, don't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, for the day you eat thereof, you'll surely die. That one prohibition tried their faith in God, and did God mean what he said? Well, certainly he did. He meant what he said. And he said what he meant. And they found out how terrible it was to violate that and plunged all of mankind into a mess. So this is the first example of positive divine law. Now, as you know, the devil through the serpent succeeded in persuading the woman, deceived her. She believed his lie and obeyed a lie, and that always brings about sin. Sin is always believing a lie and obeying it. Transgressing God's law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, and man sins. Now, through this violation, the devil succeeded in injecting sin and death into the world which God had made for man. That's the burden of the thought of Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. It's how that sin and death got into the world. Doesn't mean that everybody, as the false doctrine of Calvinism teaches, inherits the actual sin that Adam committed, as if they inherited their color of their hair and their eyes and their stature and so forth. We inherit all that from our parents, genetically speaking. But you don't inherit sin by generics. But the door was open for the way uh, for sin to get into the world, and all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. So death has come into the world. Thus, when an accountable human being, a person accountable to God for his or her actions, transgresses the law of God, that person becomes a sinner and separated from God immediately. So because of the need for redemption, God immediately promised, it was in his mind to begin with, but he promised that the Redeemer would come. And I've already mentioned that in Genesis 3. 
in verse 15. And we can understand that passage better today because we have the rest of the Bible explaining it. They didn't at that time. They knew something. They knew God was going to take care. God had a remedy, but they didn't know all about it. So the sum and substance of the first three chapters of Genesis sets out all of that. And the first messianic promise, and that's the foundation of numerous other statements and developments that go all the way on through the Bible. You get this straight, then you see other things to put on the outline as you go through relating to those ideas. Now, let's analyze it further. This great and wonderful promise involves five basic points. First of all, the fact of the need of a plan of redemption. Next of all, number two, the fact that the Redeemer would come. And point number three is the fact that the Redeemer would be a member of the human family, the seed of woman. And the fourth one is the fact that he would be miraculously brought forth. Again, the seed of woman. Seed is usually associated with the man. But here in Genesis 3.15, it's associated with the woman. And that will be consistent all the way through. Even Isaiah 7.14, it talks about a virgin having a child. But fact number five that comes out of these three chapters is there is implied the great and ultimate victory. The seed of woman would bruise the head of the serpent. Those particular facts of the redemption of man, the buying back of man from the sins he committed, the way of forgiveness of sins, are developed from here on out down through the stream of time as God unfolds gradually all the details that connect to those facts. That's the reason I say I hope you will hang this in the back of your minds as we develop searching the scriptures on Sunday morning or rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, having made the great promise that the Redeemer would come, this is where, as I said just a moment ago, God began developing what we would say is a genealogical line through which the Redeemer, the Messiah, Christ Jesus, would eventually come. What do we have now? Well, we have revealed by Moses the record of the birth and death of Abel. What do we see in this man Abel, in his character? We're shown the kind of mindset he had, the kind of disposition of heart, his attitude, and the kind of life that attitude produced. And it is the kind of life that we need today, the kind of disposition of mind, the kind of attitude, the kind of mindset, because this is the kind of mindset God requires if we would be saved. It also shows you the value of righteousness and denigrates sin as it ought to be. For sin ought to be hated by every one of us. And we ought to take hold of the remedy God has given for the forgiveness of sins and remaining faithful to the Lord. But then, of course, Cain killed Abel. And then Seth is born. Seth is born to take the place of Abel, whom God slew. Genesis 4.25 And the record of the kind of man and the faithfulness of him that Abel was in Hebrews chapter 11. But we come then in Genesis to chapter 5. And this is the line that's traced from Adam. But now notice Abel's dead. Seth was given to take his place. So the line goes from Adam to Seth. Guess who's next? Noah. Adam, Seth, and Noah. So in Genesis chapter 6 through 9, 6 through 9, we have the great account given by Moses, inspired account 
of the worldwide flood. Now, why is that there? Well, maybe several reasons, but it's the Bible record of how God, in spite of human wickedness, actually was able through his great power and providential workings to preserve the line through which the Messiah would come. Do you see it developing? That is the scheme of redemption. In chapters 10 and 11, we review the line from Noah through his son Shem right on down to Abram. So he's headed from the lineage, the genealogy, down to more specifics to a certain family, Abram. Well, from chapters 4 in Genesis all the way through chapter 11, there is that sacred account of the development and preservation of the Messianic line. Now, if I were to just stop here, believing the Bible to be inspired of God, given to direct man, that should have created in me already confidence that God is in control. You can look round about you all you want and how terrible things are in a nation and in the world, but you know, brethren, if this were 100 years ago, you could look around and see much the same thing. If you went back 200 years ago, much the same thing. Go back 500 years ago, you would see much the same thing. And as you go back to the first century, look what a mess there was there. But then go back before the flood. What was the state of the world? Men's mind were only on evil continually. Now question, is that going to thwart God in bringing the Messiah into the world? Is that going to stop him from having righteous people on this earth who love him and obey him and will take him at his word? No. We should know then that we are a part of all of this. To Abraham, remember he's in the messianic line, God made a great and we may say wonderful promise. And this promise is recorded in chapter 12 of Genesis, verses 1 through 3. This great promise, and we might say the Abrahamic covenant, is one of the most significant events in all of Bible history. I stand amazed sometime, and you've heard about it a few years ago. They came up trying to settle things in the Middle East with the Abrahamic Accords, and I thought, you're a few thousand years too late for that one. The promise made to Abraham is back over there in Genesis thousands of years ago, and through him and the development of that brings the Christ into the world. And neither the Jews nor the Arabs believe Christ to be the Son of God. Miss the whole boat. So I'm telling you about the real, genuine, God-formed Abrahamic covenant, and it was Moses that recorded it. So from the time of its making, every word in the Bible has some relationship to that promise that God originally made to Abraham. And this Abrahamic promise, or as I said, covenant, is nothing less or more, but it's wonderful, an enlargement upon the promise that we first saw and is recorded in Genesis 3 and verse 15. Basically, God promised Abram one thing. One thing. To develop his descendants into a great nation. And as Seth had been selected to be the head of the Messianic line, taking Abel's place, Abram now is selected to become the head of the Messianic nation. So you have the development of the Messianic line. And now you have unfolded for our understanding the beginning of the Messianic nation in Abraham. A great nation would involve three things. A people, a law, and a land. A people, a law, 
and a land. Now from Genesis 12 onward, we're studying about the development of that nation. Mark that from Genesis 12 onward. We're studying about the development of that nation, that messianic nation. Now mark this too. Each part of the Abrahamic promise had three distinct aspects. Three. There's a physical aspect in that promise made, God made to Abraham. And there's a typical aspect. The typical aspect finds its fulfillment in Christ. His uh, gospel or his church in fact, Peter would refer to it in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, as the holy nation. Well, in time, God gave Isaac to Abraham and Sarah. And that was all worked out because God intervened and made two people who were too old to have children have children. He's the first step, Isaac is, he's the first step in the development of of the Abrahamic promise. Specifically, through Isaac, we introduced to Jacob. You remember that Isaac married Rebekah. And 20 years later, Jacob was born. Now Jacob is the second step in the development of the promise made to Abraham. That is the Abrahamic covenant. And through Jacob... We were then introduced to the 12 sons. Of course, they in time would become the heads of the 12 tribes of whom God would build the great nation of Israel. Jacob's name is even changed. Jacob, Jacob means a hill catcher, a subtle person. And he was. But Jacob did a lot of changing in character. And now Israel means the prince of God. And so... Those descendants through his sons would bear the name the Prince of God. And before that, through Jacob, we introduced to Joseph. And in all the providential workings of God, through men who didn't care about God, even Jacob's or Joseph's own family, his own half brothers didn't care about him, sold him into slavery. Then all the things that happened to Joseph. Finally, when he reveals himself to his brothers, and that great famine which was so hard on people turned out the very thing that God used to introduce them all and get them all back together. We see that Joseph announced to him, you meant this for evil as to what you did to me, but God worked it for good. Now, I don't want to give us courage in facing whatever we face in this life because I'm limited in what I can see to the current events and things that happen here. But by the eye of faith, God is in control. If God could bring all this into being to bring about salvation through Christ, and remember Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, he's in control. He's headed for the time for Christ to come. And it didn't make any difference what people would do. There would be those who would love God and keep his commandments. So in Joseph, we have the story of how God preserved well, shall we call it the embryonic nation. And in marvelous providence, as I've already referred you to, Joseph became prime minister in Egypt. From a slave to prime minister. How did that happen? Because God's in control. Of course, later, several hundred years later, there would be a terrible bondage. But did that mean God had forgotten the promise made to Abraham? Did that mean that God had forgotten all these things through Isaac and Jacob and the 12 sons and Joseph? No. It would just be used by God to bring Israel out of bondage. So the Israelites in Egypt had a special relationship to the, now watch this, to the people aspect of God's promise to Abraham. Because in all that 430 years about, they had the time, they had the circumstances, 
they had the experiences through which you become a strong people. Strong in number, strong in character. And we'll see more about that because they had a chance in the wilderness wandering to develop even more. And God used that to weed out the people that really weren't faithful. You know what all this shows us far? God's in control. He never lost control. So God thereafter gave Israel their law. Gave it to them through a type of Christ, Moses on Mount Sinai. And then, of course, they had already been delivered from Egyptian bondage. At Sinai, God gave, we call it the Ten Commandments, or you might say it's the Constitution, of the law of Moses. And in the great wilderness journey, as I said earlier, that was a training ground by God in the use of the law of Moses, in the worship, in the tabernacle system, Levitical priesthood, and all of that. They were putting all that into practice and getting used to it. We forget sometimes that when that law was given, as soon as it was fully given on Mount Sinai, they still couldn't worship according to it. Because they had to prepare everything. The Levites had to learn their part. The priests had to learn their part. They had to build the tabernacle. They had to build all the clothing that the priests had. They had to be educated in all the sacrifices. Maybe that helps us understand why they spent a whole year at the foot of Mount Sinai after the law was given. And then they had 40 years to prove themselves. So after the period of wandering, God gave Israel the land. Moses conquered the territory that was east of Jordan, Moab and Edom and so on. And after the death of Moses, Joshua had the specific task of conquering the territory on the western side of Jordan. The land flowing with milk and honey as it was promised to them. And of settling then Israel in Canaan. Now, after Joshua, God gave Israel the judges. When Israel transgressed God's law, God would allow them to be oppressed. They would repent and they would call out for help from God. And God would raise up deliverers, judges, who would overthrow the oppressors. And these deliverers were then, as we know them, and they make up the book of Judges. This was God's system of dealing with his people. For approximately 336 years. So when you read through Judges. Read through Joshua and Judges. Part of 1 Samuel. Don't just read through it so fast. That's covering 336 years. Now think right now. Go back 336 years. You'll see how long ago that was. So God gave Israel a king then. Rebellious Israel had demanded the king to be like the nations round about them. And for 120 years, there was the United Kingdom, the kingdom and nation, if you please, of Israel, reached its pinnacle or its zenith in the days of King Solomon. Now, in 975 B.C., the kingdom divided. And we begin reading about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, composed of ten tribes, and the kingdom of Judah, mainly Judah and the small tribe of Benjamin. The northern kingdom lasted some 253 years. The southern kingdom lasted about 389 years. I hope the United States is not going to follow that length of years that we have a lot longer. <laughs> And I'm not trying to say by that that the United States compares to Israel and why it was brought to existence. I'm just saying through the history of man, nations have come up and fallen in a lot less years than that. So there were 136 years of Judah alone. Of course, Judah didn't change, continued its idolatrous actions, and God carried Judah into captivity. Well, the people have become exceedingly sinful. And in 606 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made an attack upon Jerusalem. That started, or it was the beginning, of the Babylonian captivity. 
He made a second invasion in 597. And then the final invasion with the destruction of the city and the temple in 586. Thus they all went into captivity down in Babylon. Now you mark the 70 years of Babylonian captivity from the first invasion. So once the last invasion is over in 586, they still got 50 more years in Babylon. But guess what? God's in control. He's still unfolding the scheme of redemption down through the stream of time involving man. And in time, God restored his people to their homeland, a remnant anyway. Now, the prophets of God often speak of this return. And notice a great restoration. In 536 B.C., Cyrus the Great of Persia gave the decree which allowed their return. They came back, a remnant of those Jews, and the great work of Zerubbabel, of Ezra, and Nehemiah is recorded in your Old Testament Bible, part of the Bible. Now with the end of Nehemiah's career, we come to the end of really what is Old Testament history. You must remember that all of those prophets, major and minor, fall into the area of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. And then you have Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, which covers times when they were in captivity and after they came back. So the sacred history is the gradual unfolding of God's plan for man's redemption. Through the history, this particular history I've mentioned, God was showing man, now watch it, number one, the meaning, the nature, and the consequences of sin. Number two, that man could not save himself. And number three, that man could not be saved by a pure law system. Number four, thus, there's the need of a Savior. And throughout the history that we've been looking at for a moment, we have type, we have shadow, we have copy, and we have figure of all those things that are brought to reality in the New Testament. Throughout this history, God was preparing for man's salvation through Jesus Christ. And this is where we'll stop today. Now, please take some of this material and think about what we're doing on Sunday morning, link them together, and you might get a double whammy out of it <laughs> if you'll do that in your learning about rightly dividing the word of truth and how the stream of this great scheme of redemption flows down through the unfolding of the word of the living God and that God is true to his word and his word will not fail. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we plead with you, we beg with you by the mercies of Christ and by the God who's in control of all things to believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, to truly repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. As a child of God, we hope these things have encouraged you in your Bible study, strengthened you to have a greater faith in God. But if you have sinned and need to repent, and in God's second law of pardon, we urge you to do that. Come confessing your sins, if need be praying to God for forgiveness, and we'll pray with you and for you. But our God stands ready to forgive. This whole Bible is telling you God loves you, that he's had control of history all along to bring the Christ into the world and the gospel system. If you're subject to the gospel of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.